Thank you all. Um, it's nice to be in front of a room of people who, who uh, use data to solve problems because we're sort of still in the season where political people are gathering to do these election post-mortems and so you get the folks from the Obama campaign, the Romney campaign to sit down and sort of talk through what happened and explain things. And you can tell this real generational divide, I think, uh, that exists within the campaign world now between the folks who are obsessed with reducing a presidential election to one big element that explains it all, the one demographic group that you can uh, sort of uh, peg the results on, or the one state or county that made a difference, or the one strategic move, or technical or tactical advance that, that explains it all. Um, and what I think of as a sort of you know, new generation of folks in and around campaigns who default to an assumption I think probably most of you do in, in each of the worlds in which you work, um, which is to think of complex things like presidential elections being decided by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of very small little things. And the big change that's happened in, in the world of, of political campaigns in the last decade that I write about in my book is, is basically the result of uh, two new tools, innovations, migrating into politics from other areas that give people inside campaigns the ability to measure the lots of little things that, that were previously invisible. The first of those, obviously, is, is big data, uh, statistical modeling, which in, in politics people sort of generically call micro-targeting, which I think is a term that gets used in a lot of different ways, but sort of best understood as a shift from uh, the sort of sorting through the electorate that used to take place and based on big geographic uh, uh, jurisdictions or demographic categories and, and l bringing down the unit of uh, of analysis to the individual. And, and the big breakthrough there happened in the years immediately after 2000, where people inside campaigns realized that uh, the corporate, corporate marketers, commercial data warehouses had a whole lot of more information about uh, voters than, than they did. The, the major challenge of every campaign is to sort uh, the electorate into basically one of three categories. The first decision you want to make as a campaign is to decide who you don't want to talk to. This is something that we journalists do a horrible job of writing about as a strategic decision. But a smart campaign uh, on day one um, wants to decide who will uh, never vote for them, who's very unlikely to vote at all, and which voters are already going to vote for them. And at that point, you want to push those people aside and not think about them again. Other voters you want to sort into one of two categories. You have people that you want to persuade. These are voters who are likely to cast a ballot, but uh, are not certain about who they'll vote for. There are these are people who show up in polls either as undecided or soft supporters of one side or the other. You either, if you're a campaign, they're soft supporters of yours, uh, soft supporters of your opponent that you want to win over, or soft supporters of yours that you want to uh, hedge against defection. Um, and then there are uh, voters you want to mobilize. These are people you want to turn out. These are people who uh, already support you, probably. They're on your team. They identify with your party, but they're not regular voters. And the central challenge is to uh, identify who, who should be your targets and then put them into one of these two categories. And these are two very, people in campaigns really understand this as two very different challenges between uh, persuasion, which is really about opinion formation, changing people's minds, and then uh, mobilization, which is about uh, getting people to do something they're not used to doing, something that's not their habit. Um, it's about behavior modification. And the question is, how do you sort voters, uh, uh, you know, potentially 170 million uh, uh, registered voters in the United States into, into those categories. And in an ideal world, campaigns would tell you that they would knock on the door or call every single voter and ask, uh, do you plan to vote? Who do you plan to vote for? And use that as a guide to, to that sorting process. But no campaign has the, the enough volunteers to get to everybody. Uh, no campaign has enough resources to do paid canvassing or paid phone banks to do all that. And it's getting harder and harder to, to get people to answer their phones or, or talk to a canvasser at the door. And so the question is, obviously, how do you uh, make inferences about the, the people you can't get to? And so campaigns were doing that at a, uh, at a level either of the precinct, which is a few hundred people uh, in a geographic unit, you know, roughly the size of maybe a, a, a uh, census tract, um, which is the smallest unit in which you know how people voted in a country with a secret ballot. Um, or big demographic categories. So you look at a voter registration form and it'll have somebody's name, their date of birth, so you have their age, uh, uh, gender, in some places race or ethnicity, party registration if you're in a state that has it. 
um, and then a vote history, each uh, uh, instance of an election, whether or not they went out and cast a ballot. So your voter registration form has maybe a few dozen uh, data points on it. And what people realized after 2000 was that Axiom or Info USA had hundreds of data points about, about uh, voters and started using algorithmic modeling to uh, look for uh, uh, relationships between those variables and the two outcomes that they care about. How likely are you to cast a ballot and how likely are you to support my candidate? And the shift that we saw over the last decade has been to reduce those to um, uh, a series of scores. Um, the, the parties do this each a little differently in terms of what the end product looks like. But you know, the Obama campaign had two, uh, in 2008 and 12, two basic scores that they assigned every individual. You have a turnout score, a percentage likelihood 0 to 100 that you will cast a ballot in November and a support score, a percentage likelihood that you will support Barack Obama. And the campaign used that as the unit of sorting. And so they basically have served the role in politics that uh, credit rating scores have in, in uh, the financial world, um, where it basically is automating the process of uh, uh, deciding who ought to be a target either for persuasion or mobilization. And in the same way now that you know a, a loan officer at a bank won't sign off on a, a mortgage or line of credit for you without seeing a quantitative projection of your likelihood of defaulting or paying off your bill on time. A campaign will not send somebody to knock on your door, send you direct mail without having a quantitative projection of your likelihood of, of voting already without that interaction and, and supporting your candidate to begin with. Um, and what that's allowed campaigns to do is to, uh, it sort of restored the sovereignty of individuals now because it used to be the campaigns would, would say, well, that's a precinct where, um, I'm, I'm a Republican candidate, that's a strong Democratic precinct. The uh, 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 margins are unfavorable to me there, so I won't go there at all. Or I look at my polls and I'm getting killed with women between 40 and 50, so um, I'll write them off entirely as a category. Uh, now campaigns can pick out people in those uh, units, those categories, and, and go out and engage them directly. And I think one of the underappreciated stories of, of how the Obama campaign in, in 2008 especially was able to go into states like Virginia or North Carolina where there had not been a sort of traditional democratic math uh, for, for winning statewide um, and, and design a new arithmetic. It used to be that Democrats would look at the number of strong voters that they had in strong precincts in big cities and college towns, maybe in some inner ring suburbs. Um, they'd add it up and if there weren't enough votes to get near 50%, you'd sort of say there's, there's not a way to do it. With individual level modeling, with micro-targeting, the campaign was able to go into counties where maybe the Democrats are only getting 22% of the vote, but you can pick out who the targets are where uh, you can pick out the few hundred people that you need to mobilize or on the bubble, the, 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 the people you need to persuade. And there, if you, can, if you have only 25 Democratic volunteers, um, you can have them actually go to the doors that will make a difference and skip the other ones where, where they could have a, 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 the, the wrong impact. Um, and then it becomes valuable, as the Obama campaign did, to open up field offices and hire uh, organizers to train those voters to, to have those interactions. So then the question is, okay, you know which doors to knock on. You can pick out the two doors on a block that you, um, where there's somebody you want to mobilize and the three doors on a block that you, somebody you want to persuade. And what do you do when you get there? And there are politics as campaigns have become um, informed by an innovation that came not out of the corporate world but out of the academic social sciences. Um, in the late in 1998, uh, two political scientists at Yale went out in the streets of New Haven to, to run a uh, field experiment, a, a, a randomized trial. Um, this is uh, a really novel thing for political scientists to do then. Political science had lagged behind a lot of the other social sciences, especially psychology, economics, and going out and doing field work. It's very difficult to either use your nonprofit university dollars to do partisan work and campaigns and, and party machines have generally not wanted academics anywhere near their operations. Um, uh, these two guys, Don Green and Alan Gerber, wanted to see what they could do to change an individual's likelihood of voting. And so they partnered with a local League of Women Voters chapter in Connecticut. They designed a nonpartisan get out the vote drive and they randomly assigned New Haven voters to one of four categories. A quarter of them got a pre-election get out the vote reminder by mail on a postcard. A quarter of them got a phone call from a paid call center, a quarter of them got an in-person visit from a, a canvasser, mostly grad students, and then the recorder who in a control group got nothing. And afterwards, the state of Connecticut updates their uh, uh, electoral rolls to show who voted, and you can uh, 
uh, you can see um, who cast a ballot. And it turns out that the people who got the phone call saw no increase in their, in their likelihood of voting. The people who got the, um, the mail saw a small but appreciable increase. And then the people who had the in-person visit saw a massive boost. Um, uh, they had trouble getting this paper published because it made no meaningful theoretical contributions to anything that political scientists cared about. I think in my book I described it as embarrassingly practical. Um, but it opened up for people inside campaigns um, uh, a whole new idea of, of actually empirically measuring things. And there tended to be you know, one of two responses among campaign professionals. There's either, um, you know, oh great, academics have developed a scientifically credible tool for uh, uh, disentangling cause and effect and understanding whether these uh, things that we encourage campaigns to spend tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on every year actually work. Um, and then there was another response, uh, which is, oh no, academics have developed a scientifically credible tool for determining whether these things that we get people to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on actually work. And um, within the first group, there was a, a small group of political consultants who didn't feel threatened by this innovation um, and uh, uh, decided we should not only be paying attention to what these academics learn from their tests about all these things that we do, um, but why don't we go out and run some tests of our own. And in the next basically five, seven years, um, uh, all sorts of experiments were run inside academia, inside sort of permanent political institutions, labor unions, some of the women's environmental groups, mostly on the left, who were doing elections year after year, and the idea of getting two or three percent more efficient in, in using robocalls or direct mail was of great value to them. And the easiest thing at this point to measure was mobilization or registration. Mobilization is turnout. Registration is, is whether somebody uh, goes from being unregistered to registered. And there you have a very easy and inexpensive thing to measure. It's, it's the uh, electoral rolls are, are available. It's basically a, a, a free dependent variable to, 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 to track. Um, what campaigns had a harder time doing was understanding persuasion. What gets somebody to change their mind? Um, and campaigns for a very long time have been uh, dependent on artificial settings, uh, polls and focus groups to sort of extrapolate which arguments they can make, what information they could give voters would actually uh, move their opinions. The, the big breakthrough that, that took place this past year um, uh, in the Obama campaign um, uh, is, is so far ahead of every other campaign that, that um, it's not worth talking about this as sort of an industry-wide development, but there are advantages to things you could do with a presidential re-election, um, is integrating uh, the experimental uh, method um, and randomization for uh, making empirical um, uh, assessments with micro-targeting, leveraging the maybe thousand uh, individual uh, variables that a campaign has about each voter um, and using uh, and, and modeling heterogeneous treatment effects of, of their messaging. And so what the, the Obama campaign approaches a few different ways. They, they ran what they called experiment informed programs. And here um, they would use polls, ask somebody if I told you that Mitt Romney had outsourced jobs as CEO of Bain, would it make you more or less likely to vote for him? That's a traditional way. They did some of that. Go to a focus group where you mock up a few ads or a few different pieces of mail that shows them, here's what Mitt Romney did at Bain, here's what Mitt Romney did as governor, and you ask people which, which of them changes your opinion. But the campaign also went out and randomly assigned voters to get different pieces of mail on the same theme. Um, one test they did in March was to see what types of messaging would change voters' views about Obamacare, about the Affordable Care Act. Um, so they sent some voters sort of classic, glossy political communication uh, uh, making the case for the bill. They sent some people very sort of fact-heavy, here are the elements of the legislation, here are the reforms. Um, and they uh, sent some voters a letter that was supposed to uh, look like it basically came from like an insurance company. It had a very small paid for by the Democratic National Committee thing at the bottom, but it said something like, you know, dear Sasha, under the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, you are now entitled to one free checkup from your insurance company every year. Please take the time to call your physician now to schedule this appointment. And, you know, it was a, a letter in an envelope. And they went out and they um, uh, randomly assigned these letters to voters. And because the campaign was doing a massive volume of uh, short polling calls every week to feed into their uh, micro-targeting models, they were able to see which voters' opinions, uh, w w 
which of these uh, uh, pieces of mail actually moved voters in the real world where they process information, not in the artificial setting of a focus group, but also what are the attributes of people who moved. And it turns out that you, um, uh, when you're leveraging a thousand different data points about, about each voter, you see patterns that you would never think to ask in a poll necessarily. And so, you know, one thing is they found that messaging about um, uh, Republican policies on Medicare um, didn't actually move people who were of the age of receiving Medicare, but had a significant effect on voters, I think between 45 and 55, who were, you know, on the cusp of thinking about uh, Medicare. That's not necessarily um, uh, something that uh, sort of an old school political consultant would have uh, had a hunch about um, only by going out and sending mail and then testing whose opinions are actually moving or you seeing what, what, what does. The other thing that the Obama campaign um, uh, did to model persuasion, one of the big uh, was to test the effectiveness of volunteers to change people's minds. Traditionally, campaigns have relied on uh, their paid media, their TV ads, their direct mail, um, to do the job of trying to uh, convince voters to support them and use volunteers to go out and collect data, canvassing. Uh, you know, somebody calls you during dinner, knocks on your door, and ask you a few questions. Do you plan to vote? Who do you plan to vote for? Maybe, what do you think about these two issues? Um, campaigns would use volunteers to do that or to do get out the vote, where you're basically going and giving reminders to people who you think are already your supporters, but you're telling them Tuesday's election day, can I offer you a ride to the polls? The, um, the reason campaigns would do that is that um, you're either collecting data, it's a sort of you know, straightforward, one-sided interaction, or you're going and talking to people already on your side. Campaigns don't want to use volunteers to go out and persuade people, because by definition, you're putting them in a situation with somebody who you think doesn't agree with you. And what anybody who spends time in a campaign field office will tell you is often your most enthusiastic, hardworking volunteer is the one you least want going out and interacting with people who disagree with you, because they find it irrational that somebody wouldn't want to vote for John McCain, and they'll spend 90 minutes uh, arguing with you about it. Or they think they know really good reasons why you should support their candidate, and who cares if you spent you know, millions of dollars polling uh, and, and focus, group, uh, focus grouping to, 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 to see which messages work. But the Obama campaign knew that they would have access to an exceptional um, uh, sort of bank of, of volunteer uh, time this year. Um, and the question was how they could expand the work that volunteers did beyond just registering voters, uh, canvassing, collecting data, calling, and, and doing GOTV work. And so in uh, February of last year, they had volunteers across the country um, uh, make 500,000 randomly assigned phone calls to voters who had been identified as persuadable. These are people with mid-range uh, support scores. They're, they hadn't been modeled as uh, too strongly likely to support Obama or too likely to, to support the Republican. Um, and uh, the volunteer callers were given um, a sort of a rough script, a structure for having a conversation. They, uh, they called, they went through, they this uh, uh, back and forth with the voter, and the campaign was able to see which voters had changed their uh, support over within the following week. Um, and they came up with another uh, score, um, a persuasion score, a zero to 10 ranking uh, assessment of the likelihood that a voter would change his or her mind after an interaction, persuasive interaction with an Obama volunteer. Um, uh, a uh, nine represented a very high likelihood that somebody would move towards Obama, a one a low likelihood. A zero um, was the idea that it would be what they called anti-persuasive or that it would have a backlash effect, that talking to an Obama volunteer would make somebody more likely to support Romney. And what this allowed the campaign to do was to dramatically expand the range of things that they used their volunteers to do. And so they were making the argument for Obama, not just on TV and in direct mail in the, in the places where they could control every word, but were able to trust their volunteers to go knock on doors. And so one of the big mysteries of this year was, why is Obama opening all these retail field offices around America? Well, it's because they were leveraging data, um, uh, big data statistical modeling, and all of this experimental ability to understand what actually could change people's opinions or modify their behaviors, and knew how to use everyday people to make it happen. Thank you.